No Christian today who worships this God and rests in Him by faith should get the jitters that the world is careening out of control towards some meaningless catastrophe. It isn't. We might feel like we're being thrown all over the place in a stagecoach driven by six wild horses like I used to see on westerns, bouncing up and down without any springs. But fear not, sitting over our heads completely serene is Almighty God and the hands who made the world hold the reins. How should God's absolute sovereignty stabilize our hearts when the world seems out of control? That's the question John Piper answers from the book of Obadiah in this episode of Light and Truth. The sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on November 7th, 1982. Old Testament prophet Obadiah it's the littlest book in the Old Testament, so you may have trouble finding it. It comes right after Amos and just before Jonah. Not only is it the littlest book in the Old Testament, but the author is a person about which we know nothing, except that he wrote this book. There are 11 other people in the Old Testament named Obadiah, but there's no evidence that this Obadiah is one of those. So we're really in the dark about his background. We only know that he spoke the word of God, as he says. The prophecy was delivered, evidently, very soon after the captivity of Judah in 587 B.C., when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. I see it falling into two halves. The first is verses 1 through 16. And these verses are directed against the nation of Edom, that is, the descendants of Esau who lived in the southeast sector of the land just southeast of the Dead Sea. The second half of the prophecy, verses 17 to 21, focuses on the vindication of Israel and the establishment of God's final kingdom on the earth. And my sense of what the main point of this book is, is that it is an encouragement to God's people that their God, in spite of the fact that they are now in exile, is still master of the universe, that wrongs will be righted, and that one day he will establish his kingdom over the whole earth, and his people will be gathered in safety with him forever. So what I'd like to do with you, since it's a very short book, is just read it with you, straight through, pausing at several places to make some observations with you. So let's begin at verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God, concerning Edom. We have heard tidings from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. So, the first thing Obadiah tells us is that his vision is from the Lord. And secondly, that it concerns Edom. And thirdly, that God has evidently in some way sent out a report to muster the nations to oppose Edom. Now, in verses 2 through 16, God addresses Edom himself. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is high, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is among the stars, thence I will bring you down, says the Lord. So the Lord declares to Edom that the root cause of her calamity and her judgment is pride. 
pride which has deceived her into thinking that she is secure above the reaches of man, like an eagle soaring high, building her nest in the stars. And God's word to Edom is, Eagle Edom will come down. And then in verses 5 and 6, he describes how thorough the destruction will be. If thieves came to you, if plunderers by night, oh, how you have been destroyed, would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. In other words, the ruin that is coming upon Edom is total, not partial as though a thief or a grape gatherer were coming against them. For they always leave a little something. God will leave nothing. Verse 7. All your allies have deceived you. They have driven you to the border. Your confederates have prevailed against you. Your trusted friends have set a trap under you. There's no understanding of it. In other words, the Edomites will have nowhere to turn, no allies on whom to bank when the judgment comes against them. And they have no understanding at all at this point that all their allies have already begun to turn against them. I think what we see in verse 7 is a fulfillment of the promise in verse 1, where a report is sent among the nations to muster the nations against Edom. And here we find that the nations have in fact begun to turn against Edom. Verses 8 and 9. Will I not on that day, says the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and the understanding out of Mount Esau, and your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Teman was a grandson of Esau, and after him was named one of the great cities of Edom, evidently a cultural and military center where the intellectual and military elite gathered and God says that he's not impressed or threatened in the least by this military might or this intellectual elitism, but rather he will cut them off in their pride, both strong and wise together. And then in verses 10 to 14, we see how Edom's pride had shown itself at the point when her brother, Israel was at his lowest ebb. For the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But you should not have gloated over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gates of my people in the day of his calamity. You should not have gloated over his disaster in the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods in the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the parting of the ways to cut off his fugitives. You should not have delivered up his survivors in the day of distress. When a person is in the bondage of pride, they always seek ways to exalt themselves over other people. Nations and adults and children have this in common. Apart from the grace of God, we always take pleasure in other people's failures. Why? Because it tends to, to assuage the pain of our own inadequacies and it tends to magnify 
our successes. Edom relished, relished the destruction of Judah. She stood aloof. She gloated. She boasted. She looted. And she ran after them like a little nipping dog, cutting off the stragglers. Now, Obadiah knows that he and his people are guilty. It was God's judgment that they were going into exile. But they also know that Edom is not innocent. Edom, too, is guilty. And justice seems to cry out that something must be done with this nation that gloated over the destruction of God's people. What should Edom have done? Jesus taught us what they should have done. We know that they should have looked upon the judgment of their brother and shuddered and humbled themselves. If it was for pride that Judah was going into exile, woe to us if we become arrogant and exalt ourselves over our brother. They should have repented. You remember what what Jesus said in Luke 13 when a tower in Siloam fell and killed a lot of people? And they came to Jesus to ask him about this. And Jesus said, do you think that those people were worse sinners than you? Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Any time calamity falls someone, we should shudder, not gloat. Lest we too become proud and fall in the same judgment. Now, God reveals to Obadiah that he will not let this sin go unpunished. Verses 15 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, Edom, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountains, all the nations round about shall drink and they shall drink and stagger and shall be as though they had not been. Now, Here's what's happening. Obadiah is looking into the future here by God's revelation, and he is seeing the great and terrible day of the Lord on its way in judgment when all the accounts will be settled in the nations and among individuals. And in typical prophetic perspective, he doesn't distinguish between the more immediate fulfillments of historical judgment on Edom, which came very soon, and that very distant end time judgment at the end of the age when all the nations would be gathered for judgment. In typical prophetic perspective, the nearer and the more distant future merge and he sees one great day of the Lord. And that uh, ambiguity in time is no hindrance to understanding the prophecy because what matters here is not the precise timing of when the judgment falls, but the certainty that judgment is coming, justice will be done, the Chaldeans and the Edomites will not go on boasting forever. Very soon recompense will come on them, and then finally at the end of the age, all the guilty will be brought to account. Now that's the end of part one, verses one to sixteen. And the point seems to be this. Eagle Edom will come down for her pride and for her violence. Now, part two, verses 17 to 21. Here, Obadiah assures the people of Judah that there will be on the day of the Lord a way of escape in Zion. Judah, we learned last week, went into exile because of her own pride and sin. Edom is going to experience the judgment of God because of her pride. Can we not infer from those two facts that the escape promised in verse 17 is not an escape that's handed out to people on the basis of their ethnic connections, say Jewishness, but rather is an escape for those who have learned the lesson from the judgment upon Judah, from the judgment upon the Edomites, namely, God hates pride 
And God accepts the humble who trust in him. So I think when it promises escape, it promises escape to those who, according to Habakkuk, live by faith. So the second part of this prophecy has as its main point, I think, to hold out comfort and encouragement to the people. There is a way of escape, though the day of the Lord is coming as judgment. Let's read these verses 17 to 21. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau stubble. And they shall burn them and consume them and there shall be no survivor to the house of Esau for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev, now it's talking about Jewish Refugees here. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Those of the Shephelah, the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. In other words, the Jews are reclaiming the land. And then, and the exiles of the host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepherat shall possess the cities of the Negev. Savior shall go up to the Mount Zion to rule Esau, Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The point there seems to be this, mainly. The promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob centuries ago that they would possess the land will not be frustrated. Now, from our New Testament perspective, we can see that the fulfillment of this prophecy both the prophecy concerning the the redeemed people and the reclaimed land are much bigger than Obadiah said. For example, we know now that the people of God who will be part of his kingdom on earth are not merely the redeemed in Israel, physical Israel, but include all those who put their faith in the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Here's the way Paul put it in Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So the people who are going to inherit the promise are not just the Jews who are faithful, but also the whole church who is faithful to Christ. And the land that they will inherit is much bigger than Obadiah saw as well. For example, Paul said in Romans 4.13 that the descendants of Abraham will inherit the world. And Jesus taught in Matthew 5.5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit, what? The earth. Now, isn't that implied here in the last verse of Obadiah? When it says, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Can we really imagine that when God finally establishes his kingdom on the earth, that it will involve only a little patch of land in the Middle East while it is surrounded by rebellious, unsubdued unbelievers? No, because Psalm 22, 28 says plainly, the kingdom belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Yea, to him shall all the proud bow down in the earth. Before him shall all who go down to the dust bow. So repentant, Christ honoring Israel will have her land. But it's only going to be one little province in the worldwide kingdom of our Lord and Christ. And it will be shared freely with every tongue and tribe and nation who have put their trust in the Messiah and have become one with the Jews in the body of the Savior. In conclusion now, let me draw out five lessons from Obadiah that will, I think, impact on the way we live today. First, the God of this book is 
the ruler in the world. He governs the nations and does as he pleases on the earth. If that were not so, then he could not promise to Judah that she would be restored. And he could not promise to Edom that she would come down. God can only talk like that because he is Lord of the nations. So no Christian today who worships this God and rests in him by faith should get the jitters that the world is careening out of control towards some meaningless catastrophe. It isn't. We might feel like we're being thrown all over the place in a stagecoach driven by six wild horses like I used to see on westerns bouncing up and down without any springs. But fear not, sitting over our heads completely serene is Almighty God and the hands who made the world hold the reins. Second, pride is deceptive. Verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Pride makes us think that we can be independent self-sufficient, invulnerable. And it's based on a lie. The person who yields to the sin of pride surrenders his capacity to think and feel and act without deception. Every act, every thought, every feeling of the person in the grip of pride is distorted and confused. My own conviction is that most of the perplexity that we feel in our day regarding moral and theological issues is owing to remnants of our pride, not the complexity of the issue. Third, God abominates pride and will bring it down. Verse four. Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, thence I will bring you down, says the Lord. Or to use the words of Jesus in Luke 16:15, what is exalted among men is an abomination to the Lord. Fourth, therefore, Proud nations and proud individuals will reap what they sow. Verse 15. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return upon your own head. If we choose in our pride independence, God will give it to us on the day of judgment. He will not be our refuge. He will not be our righteousness. He will let us stand there in our sovereign self-sufficiency and our self-confidence will be like a feather in a hurricane when the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And finally, and fifth, God has made a way of escape and salvation from his wrath. Verse 17 In Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy. In other words, those who have fled from the wickedness of pride to the holiness of humility will find refuge in the day of the Lord in Mount Zion. Mount Zion, the city of God, is going to be full of Not of people who've never sinned. That's not why it's holy. Not full of people who've never sinned. But people who have been broken and humbled by their sin. And have thrown themselves on Jesus for hope and for security. And have come to love Jesus Christ more than they love anything and anybody in the whole world. Shall we pray? Father, would you grant that we understand with our minds and mean earnestly with our hearts 
what we say when we sing, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 11-part series, God's Voice in the Minor Prophets, with a sermon titled, Divine Compassion and Human Resistance. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.